Hi everyone, welcome to the RTX 4070 buying guide. As usual, we will compare which models have better coolers, VRMs, and power limits. The cooler design is especially important where better cards will run cooler and quieter. In terms of performance, any RTX 4070 will perform similarly at default. It's only when you overclock that the more capable cards will see performance differences. But even if you don't plan to overclock, there is no downside to picking a better card as long as you don't pay significantly more. That last part is important. These RTX 40 series GPUs use less power than the previous generation GPUs. So a card with a weaker VRM is not as catastrophic as it previously was. However, the current capability of the VRM components are still a good indicator on whether the manufacturers cut corners on the PCB design. A more capable VRM will also safely allow a higher power limit mod via a shunt mod that can allow a much higher sustained overclock. The minimum NVIDIA reference specification, which is also on the Founders Edition card, is the 6-phase by 50M VRM, totaling 300 amps for the core, and 2-phase by 50M, totaling 100 amps for the memory. The GPU runs in between 1.0 to 1.1 volts by default, and at its 200 watt power limit that is about 200 amps of current, which means even the weakest VRMs here will still be able to handle an RTX 4070 at default settings. I would just avoid power limit mods on the weaker 6-phase cards. I would say the 8-phase 400 amp and higher cards are plenty even for an overclock RTX 4070 with power limit mods. One thing that stands out to me here is that the ASUS Trix seems to just reuse the PCB from the ASUS Tough Gaming RTX 4070 Ti. Therefore, it is not absurdly powerful, nor does it have an advanced digital voltage controller like the other Strix cards from ASUS. Now for the power limits, the RTX 4070 uses the same GA104 die as the RTX 4070 Ti, just with a 23% reduction in core counts from 7680 CUDA cores to 5888 CUDA cores. Considering it keeps the same memory bus width, the power limiter is reduced disproportionately high compared to the reduction in functional areas of the silicon. At a reduction of 30% from 285 watts to 200 watts. This causes the RTX 4070 to constantly hit the power limiter even at default settings, which can be seen from how the core clocks are much less stable than the RTX 4070 Ti, with voltage also dropping down as low as 1 volt on some cards. To achieve similar clock speed stability as the RTX 4070 Ti, it should have had at least a 230 watt power limit. Unfortunately, only the colorful Neptune has a 230 watt default power limit. All the other cards are either 200 or 215 watts. Fortunately, there are cards that allow the power limit to be increased to 240 watts or higher. These are the cards to get if you're looking to get higher and more consistent performance out of the RTX 4070. I do have to note that the power limits on the ASUS Strix are speculated since there doesn't seem to be anyone that has the ASUS Strix RTX 4070 yet. Though it uses the same RTX 4070 Ti tough PCB, so I speculated that it has the same 314 watt maximum power limit as that card while retaining the typical 215 watt default power limit like the other RTX 4070s. Now for the cooling performance of the different cards, it is impossible to find performance results on every model as not every one of them gets reviewed. But I did gather the performance results measured by Tech Power Up to combine them to a really large result that can be used to compare the cards. I combined the results by correcting the temperatures to Tech Power Up's results by calculating the average delta temperature and noise measured on the same cards that Tech Power Up tested and applying a correction to any card that isn't tested by Tech Power Up to be able to be added in the same graph. The result is this combined graph, which isn't completely accurate by any means, but it is good enough to give an idea of how these cards stack up. Here we can see that the temperatures are never really an issue with any of the RTX 4070s, with the worst GPU temperatures around 70 degrees and hotspot temps in the 80s. Memory temps are also reasonable since they only have 6 GDDR6 chips for their 192-bit bus. Before I get into this graph, I need to point out that the Palette Jetstream card is the exact same card as the Palette Gaming Pro and the Gainward Panther and Phoenix cards. The Gainward Ghost is also the same exact card as the Palette Duel, and the Gigabyte Gaming OC is the same exact card as the Aero OC. So you can reference the performance of those cards in the graph for those other cards that are the same but not in the graphs. 
The Asus Tough OC, Gigabyte Gaming OC, and the Palette Jet Stream runs the coolest, but the difference can be seen in the noise levels, where the Asus card is 2 dBA quieter than the Palette and 4 dBA quieter than the Gigabyte card. The Asus card can even drop 4 dBA lower while only increasing temperatures by 2 degrees, showing it has the most capable cooler of all. The Asus Dual OC also shows it is the best dual fan card. The Inno 3D iShell X3 is also impressive as it beat out the MSI Gaming X Trio in temperatures. And while this review doesn't measure noise levels, which kinda sucks, the fan RPM are quite low, indicating low noise levels. The same can't be said for the Galaxy EX, however, which seems to be tuned with a much too aggressive fan profile. This is the same issue as the Gigabyte Wind Force, but worse since that card has even worse temperatures. The PNY Accelerate, on the other hand, is tuned well and it is the second quietest card while being a thinner dual slot design with triple fans. On the other hand, the MSI Ventus 3X performs decently well on first glance, but it has a fatal flaw that invalidates this performance. For those looking for a compact dual slot dual fan card, the Inno 3D Twin X2 is the best cooled card. The PNY Virto Dual and Gainward Ghost rounds up the rear together with the NVIDIA Founders card where this time NVIDIA is not shooting for the top position. For the other cards that don't have reviews yet, here's a tier list that I came up with. As per usual, this isn't 100% accurate as it's really just my estimation from seeing the cards that were reviewed and comparing them to how the coolers of these other non-reviewed cards are built. This should still be accurate enough that the cards in the same tier will perform similarly in terms of cooler performance. There is no particular order inside the tiers themselves, aside from alphabetical order. In the SS tier, there is only the colorful Neptune, which by nature of being water-cooled will always have an advantage over the air-cooled cards. Although I really don't see the point in water-cooling these cards, as the S tier air-cooled cards are so good already, maintaining temperatures that are at 60 degrees or even lower sometimes. The ASUS Trix, ASUS Tough, Colorful Vulcan, and Gigabyte cards, as well as the Inno 3D iShell X3, are all top tier air cooled cards. Next down are the A tier cards, which are still very good performing coolers, just slightly warmer and noisier than the S tier. The MSI Gaming X Trio is so close to being an S tier, but they do leave the memory VRM uncooled. Even if it is not as catastrophic as leaving the core VRM uncooled, it is just not at the same level as the other S tier cards. Then there are the B tier cards, which are either kinda bad triple fan cards or good dual fan cards. The C tier cards are the bare minimum dual fan cards, which is surprising that the Nvidia Founders is here. When considering Nvidia has been trying to compete with the best on the RTX 4080 and 4090. These aren't unusable on the C tier but they're definitely going to be noisier and hotter than the higher tier cards. On the other hand, we have the first ever F tier in this buying guide, both in the cooler tiers and also in the overall tiers as you'll see later. And these are the MSI Ventus cards. All of them have the same fatal flaw of leaving out a single core VRM near the edge of the PCB uncooled. Not only does it not contact the heatsink at all, but it is in an area where airflow is blocked by the heatsink. The result is that this VRM phase hits almost 100 degrees Celsius as seen in this Guru 3D review. That is unacceptably hot for a VRM even if it is technically within spec. The VRM might be 100 degrees on the outside, but it could even be hotter on the inside of the chip itself. So this might be actually way too close to the maximum temperature spec of the VRM phase, which is the power stage. Landing the MSI Ventus cards, the first ever F tier position in the cooling tier in my buying guides. Lastly, here is the overall tier list of all the cards. This is not in any particular order within the tiers again, except for alphabetical order, as there are more closely matched cards in this generation than ever before, which makes it really difficult to put one card over the other for the whole stack of different models. If any manufacturer disagrees with this list, Please contact me and convince me why your card should be hired by probably sending me a review sample so I can actually see it for myself. Otherwise, I am very confident in the tiers that I place these cards at. The point of this tier list is to buy as high tier cards as possible in the budget that you are spending. Buy a higher tier card if it's the same price as a lower tier card that you are looking at.
The S tier cards are only for the cards that do everything right with a good cooler, a strong VRM and a high enough power limit. I would note that I don't actually know what the real power limit is on the Asus Trix since not a single person seems to have their hands on it yet. In fact, I don't even know if the Asus Trix RTX 4070 even exists. But based on the past Trix cards, they are for sure going to be some of the highest power limit cards. The colorful Neptune is for sure the best cooled RTX 4070 with it being the only water cooled card. But the necessity of water cooling an RTX 4070 is questionable at best. So the other air cooled version of it, that is the Vulcan, is pretty much as good as it gets. Gigabyte also puts massive coolers on their gaming OC and era OC cards, only beaten out by their Aorus MasterCard. Next are the A tier cards, which all have coolers that are almost as good as the S tier, but set with low power limits in the BIOS. These cards are great if you don't want to overclock or just want to undervolt the GPU. They also have powerful enough VRMs to handle any kind of power limit mods if you do want to overclock them. The only exception is the MSI Gaming Trio cards which have 240 watt power limits but their cooler still leaves the memory VRM phases uncooled unlike the other S tier cards. This is not really a big deal as the GDDR6 pulls a fraction of the power of the GPU core itself and the memory VRM does get direct airflow in this case so the VRM shouldn't get that hot. But it just isn't good enough to be in the S tier when the other S tier cards cool everything properly. The B tier cards are for the cards that have coolers that are a little bit worse than the A tier cards and or weaker reference spec VRMs, making them very unsuitable for any kind of power limit mods when overclocking. These cards will work just fine at default or under vaulted though. I would say the Zotac cards are yet again out of place in the B tier when their VRMs and power limits are decently good. But their coolers are just not as good as the other A tier cards, despite how large they are. I can't make a direct comparison with the other cards in the temperature graphs since the reviewer that reviewed this was not thorough enough. But I can tell that those temperatures are really high for the fan speeds that they run at. They always seem to underperform compared to other cards with similarly sized coolers. Therefore I can only put them in the B tier. Now the last of the usable cards, the C tier. These cards are basic dual fan designs with reference VRMs and low power limits. Quite surprising to see the Nvidia Founders here after seeing how tryhard the RTX 4080 and 4090 Founders editions were. These cards will work just fine for default settings as long as you're not too worried about temperatures or noise levels. And finally we have the first ever F tier in my buying guide, courtesy of MSI and their Ventus series. They debut as one of the worst cards in my first buying guide and they came back and bested themselves by making themselves an F tier this time around. Like I explained earlier, these cards leave a single GPU core via RAM phase uncooled by the main heatsink. Not only that, the positioning of the VRM also leaves it with virtually no airflow from the fans due to the heatsink blocking airflow to it. This leaves the VRM to cook itself, reaching nearly 100 degrees in this Guru 3 review. And this is only the surface temperatures that they're measuring using an inaccurate flare camera. The insides of the VRM phase itself could be much hotter than the 100 degrees that they're measuring here. While this isn't so catastrophic that it's higher than the spec of the power stage and blows up, this is actually really close because, like I said, the inside might be hotter than what they measured. But this is also just unacceptable for a mid-high-end card like the RTX 4070. Uncooled VRM designs like this are usually reserved only for low-end low-power cards, not high-powered cards like the RTX 4070. The RTX 4070 is a 200 watt TGP card, which is similar to the RTX 2080 flagship that Nvidia debuted back then. With the 6-phase VRM that Defensus has, that single VRM phase has to supply as much as 33 amps by itself. That's not insignificant and that will cause the VRM to produce meaningful amounts of heat that needs to be actively cooled either by a heatsink or a lot of airflow. Neither of which in this card. Therefore, I just cannot recommend the MSI Ventus series of cards and if you bought one and it's still in its return period, I would return it ASAP for a different RTX 4070. That's all for this buying guide. Hopefully most of you haven't bought the MSI Ventus series but aside from that, the other cards are actually pretty okay. 
Leave a comment down below if you tried cooking an egg on your MSI Ventus and leave a like if I made you feel good about your RTX 4070 purchase. And as always, subscribe if you don't want to miss more buying guides like this. Thanks for watching.